chapter 21, verses 5 through 19. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the remembering was the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they are about to take place? And he replied, watch out that you are not deceived for many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute, persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and put you in prison and you will be brought before kings and governors and all on the account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me, but make up your mind not to worry beforehand. How will you defend yourselves? For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversar adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, and sisters, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I'm one of those people that really enjoys a good, <clears throat> happy story, a good joke at the beginning sometimes. And I came across a couple of humorous stories that kind of, one of them reminded me of home. And it's, you know, the the stories that they start out, okay, I've got good news for you and I've got bad news. So the young man calls up his dad, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to replace it with the young woman because I'm sure this has happened in my house. It's just that my husband hasn't told me. The good news and the bad news. So the young woman calls up her dad and says, hey, dad, I've got good news for you and I've got bad news. Dad says, you know, I am really busy right now. This isn't the best time to talk to me. <clears throat> You're going to have to keep this short. So you know what, tell me what the good news is right now, and later when I get home, you can tell me the bad news. He says, okay, Dad, the good news is the airbags work. <laughs> now, any of you who know our family, you know that's probably something that may have happened in the past. Or you have the, the artist that's out there trying to thrive, to make a living, and he goes into the art gallery, and the artist um, was so proud of his work, and the art gallery says, you know, I got a lady that came in and was very interested in your artwork. And she wanted to know, if you died, if something happened to you, would your artwork be worth more money? And I told her it would. And she bought up every painting in the store of yours. And he was so proud, so glad, he had actually made a little money on his artwork, but then he said, well, who was this? He says, it was your doctor. <laughs> there are many stories that kind of connect sometimes through our lives, but it, it's kind of humorous when you are realizing how close it comes. And, and usually it's the cynical side of us that realizes it's the good news and the bad news. But, you know, there's a wonderful, famous insurer in England called Lloyd's of London, and they have a historic bell that actually sits in their office, and it's called the Bad News Bell. The reason it's called the Bad News Bell is because clear back in 1799, the Lloyd's of London had actually insured a boat to go to Germany because Germany was having a crash of their stock market. It was a financial crisis for them, and they were sending silver and gold 
in order to help them through this financial time. The name of the ship was called the HSS Lutine. It never made it, never got to Germany. It actually got caught up in a storm and it crashed on the Scotland, the shores of Scotland somewhere. Well, it wasn't until 1858 um, that some of the people that were doing the scouting, trying to find, they had a, a group of divers that were trying to find the shipwreck, of course, because it had gold and silver in it. And this was a pretty significant wreck because 240 men lost their lives. There was only one that survived that shipwreck. But the divers, when they went down, they found a part of the ship lutein, and when they went down to get it, the one part they found was the bell. And they thought, you know, we're going to send this bell back to the Lloyds of London. They did that. And they hung the bell in the underwriter's office. And every time a ship was supposed to show up and it didn't show up, they would ring the bell once. If the ship was supposed to arrive and it did arrive on time, they rang the bell twice. This went on for a many, many years. And then they kind of stopped doing that. But the, rang, the bell got rang two times in our most recent history. It got rang once when Princess Diana was, <coughs> was killed. It also got rung when 911 occurred. And in recent years, you know, you think about good news and bad news. But in the Bible passage, today Jesus delivered some pretty bad news to these guys. All of a sudden, they were going to be persecuted. All of a sudden, they were going to have to deal with ways of, of what God had planned for them. And Jesus and his disciples were amazed at this wonderful temple that they were in. And the disciples couldn't even help remarking on how beautiful that temple was. It had marble. It had rock that was covered with gold. In fact, I would imagine that from a distance, this particular temple showed up like a beacon. And Jesus had the sad task of telling these disciples some really bad news because he doesn't get to the good news until the end. Their life is there. They knew it. Their Jewish life, their faith, it was going to be destruction. And not only that, but his followers were going to experience, they were going to experience threats on their life, persecution, but Jesus reminds him, says, as for what you see here, the things we touch, the things we see in the world, our possessions, our security, some of these things that we can depend on on a daily basis are all superficial, and in some cases, they're not even real. For example, what I learned about the market of counterfeiting was a little alarming to me, but uh, it is huge business. It's $462 billion of business to counterfeit, things that we think are real that aren't. We found out that people counterfeit purses, they counterfeit watches, they counterfeit clothing, blue jeans, Levi's, handbags, watches, and even more scarier in the medical field, we're now seeing counterfeits of things like Tamiflu, Lipitor, and Viagra. All of these are things that people we think are real and they aren't. But Jesus knew that the fear motivates people. To put our trust in things we can touch is so much easier for us. We can see things. We can own things. But it's that fear that helps us to kind of motivate some worldly power. Sometimes we find significance in our home. Sometimes it could be our church our church buildings, maybe the way we appear, maybe our possessions. And all of that worry about losing those things kind of gets us chasing those tangible things in our life. Now, I have to tell you, I was kind of smiling because Sue was bringing up about a marathon race, and I thought, how did she know this was in my sermon? But last weekend, I spent 48 hours in some place called the Outer Banks. And it's in North Carolina. And I was kind of tickled because I looked at the weather today before I came to church. And, and the Outer Banks in North Virginia, North Carolina, sorry. It was 60 degrees last Sunday. And I went down there because I promised one daughter that if she ever ran in a marathon race, I promise you I'll be there at the end. So I did. I flew down there late Friday night and got back at 2 o'clock in the morning on Monday. It was a fool's errand, but it was wonderful, and I was there. 
but it was great. And I don't know if you know much about the Outer Banks, but it's like a, almost a 30-mile stretch of peninsula that goes into the Atlantic Ocean. And they start at Kitty Hawk, and they go all the way to Mantillo. Now, the only two things I required at the end of the race was that she was on her feet, she looked normal, and she was breathing. You know, <clears throat> and she was, all three of those things. So I, I was doing well. So I got her back to wherever she, drove back to wherever she was at. But, you know, the marathon race is a 26.2-mile race. That's a long race. Well, she was proud because she didn't stop to walk. I said, hey, I don't care. I'm proud that you just got to the end. But, you know, at one point in time, the most famous marathon is actually our Boston Marathon. Now, the Boston Marathon is kind of nice. When you race at the Outer Banks, you start at one end at Kitty Hawk, and it goes straight to the end. Not in the Boston Marathon. They wiggle through streets. They have different turns and corners, and they paint a blue line on the highway or the road so that these runners know where to go. One year, one year, somebody decided to paint a blue line going a different direction, and it was to end up in an alley. So it would have been a dead end. Well, it was a prankster, and they caught on to it before the race actually started. But sometimes in our life, sometimes we find ourselves kind of feeling like we stray away from our faith. We stray away in a different direction. We follow things that are not meant to be followed, and it makes it a challenge for our Christian life. And this it's sometimes because we get scared, we get anxious, we want to follow the things we know that we can see. And the solution to fear is to trust God, no matter what the future plans are. That's not an easy thing to do. When you get up in the morning and you're not sure how that day is going to end out, if you're not sure how the test is going to be, if you're traveling someplace new, if you have a new job, if you're quitting a job, all those things become unknown. And one bishop actually put it in words. He said, all worry is atheism because it is a want of trust in God. Worry, a form of atheism, because it stems from focusing on what's earthly, what we consider security. From the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he actually told us about the visions of heaven in which all people from all nations would find their identity and their security. It took their identity and security into a magnificent temple, and they invested into the temple. That is who they were. That temple became what they believed in. But Jesus did something different. Jesus took those teachings, and he left the temple, he left the church, and he went beyond that door and he took it to the average person that was out on the street. He took it to the lepers. He took it to the women in the, at the well. He took it to the Samaritans. He took it to the tax collectors. We've had messages about this all fall. And he shared a secret with a very despised Samaritan woman, and that was what he told her is that the worship is no longer confined to the temple. <clears throat> he said a time is coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father and the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seek. You know, our lesson today, what I want to bring up is that Jesus reminds us that the earthly things that we sometimes put trust in, those things are destroyed. And it's the Spirit of God working in our hearts that brings about the holiness and our justice and righteousness and peace. Because sometimes we get deceived. Sometimes we follow those tangible things in our life. And those things are, we're surrounded sometimes by very hard times and persecution. And sometimes those tangible things that we trust in fall apart. Jesus wants us to take those tough times that we have, those suffering times we have, and we are to be a witness to God. How would it change every one of our lives if we took the tough times we had and used it as an opportunity to be a missionary for God? How would it change our lives if you turned your suffering into an opportunity to share God's word? 
you know, I don't know where all of you are at in your personal life. But Jesus promises us in, in this Bible passage that God has already prepared to defend those who believe in him. And he will give the words to share their faith with conviction. And a, not a hair of their heads will be perished. And they will stand firm and they will win their lives. You know, there were two young people. One was called Diet Eman, and the second one was called Hein. They were Dutch Christians. And they were involved in the saving as many Jewish citizens as they could. They were Dutch Christians, and they housed them. They hid them. They helped them to transport them. Eventually, they got caught, and they got sent to concentration camps. Diet, they were in love with each other, but Diet went to one concentration. Hein went to another concentration camp. And while Diet was there, she took one of the hairpins that she had and she scratched a promise from Matthew 28 on the prison wall. And it was this, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end. Diet made it out of the concentration camp, but Hein did not. And he wrote a letter to Diet. And this is what he said. Here we see again that we do not decide our own lives. Darling, don't count on our seeing each other again. Even if we won't see each other again on earth, we will never be sorry for what we did, that we took this stand, and know, yet that of every last human being in this world, I loved you most. You know, we don't get to decide our own lives. We don't always get to tell how the end of our story is going to be written, and Jesus knew that truth could follow. His followers did not know the end of their story. He knew that his followers were going to have great fear and anxiety, and it could lead them down a different road. Or it could lead them to decide to trust God, to see any suffering they came into as an opportunity to share God's love for them and their faithfulness. And ultimately, it's about the good news. It's the greatest news that we are really not in control. Our lives, our destinies, we have a loving God that's in control, and every good thing in our life that we have lost will be restored, and we will live life more fully and more wondrously than we have ever imagined. Can we bow our heads? Praise you, Father, for our opportunity to lift you up. Praise you for an opportunity to know your love and to be able to stand strong even if our lives become a challenge, that we can use that opportunity to be a messenger for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.